Amen. How many of you have made a resolution? Okay, I'm going to say, if nobody raises your hand, this is going to blow my whole sermon. So come on. <laughs> Somebody lie and raise your hand if you have it. <laughs> You've made a resolution. Good, okay. How many of you have kept it so far? It is only the third day of the year, so we should still be good, right? But what are some resolutions that we make, right? I'm going to watch less TV. I'm going to spend less time on my phone. That's the one my wife wishes that I would make. I'm going to join a gym and lose weight and get into shape. If you read my newsletter article, you know, round is shape. So if you're round, you're still in shape. So this may not be the shape you want to be in, but it's a shape. So, right? We make these resolutions, right? I have not been to the Y yet this year. Most of you know I go to the Y quite frequently. I see quite a few of you there, actually. I've not been there yet this year, but January is the month that I don't like going to the Y. Do you want to know why? Because everybody else has decided that they're going to go and get, get healthy. So everybody is there. February will be better. They'll slack off, right? Because we make these resolutions because we think that we need to change ourselves. And I'm not saying that change isn't good. But do we really need to change ourselves? Because God made us perfect the way that we are. Right? In the beginning, God created everything. And he saw everything and he said, It is good. You're good the way you are. You don't need to change you. If there's something in your life that needs to be changed, guess who's going to do it? God is. Whether you let him or not. So I'm not... Don't get me wrong, resolutions are good. If you want to get in the way to shape and you want to start exercising more, that's probably not a bad idea. But if you stop doing it after a while, it's okay. Because that's not what the new year or the new beginning is about. And John shows us in his birth narrative, right? What we read this morning from the Gospel of John is John's rendition of Jesus' birth story. And he's pretty audacious. How did John's reading start this morning? When John wrote his Gospel, he wrote it and he said, In the beginning. Where does that come from? Genesis. Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created. John copies the beginning of the whole Hebrew scriptures by starting his gospel with the words in the beginning. It'd be like me sitting down to write a novel and saying, and I read this from David Lowe. It'd be like me sitting down to write a book and starting it. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Right? I see the older people going... And the younger people are all staring at me like, what the world is he talking about? Go look it up and read it. It's a, it's a classic, you need to read it. But that's, isn't that something, me saying that I'm like, you know? I'm in no way, shape, or form the same as that author. But yet I'm claiming. And that's what John does this morning when he says, in the beginning. He claims this is the beginning. It's just the same as God creating the heavens and the earth. This is a new beginning. And he tells us some promises that we can hold on to. Unlike the resolutions that we make that we'll leave in the dust. I'm going to ask again in February. I'm, those of you that raise your hand, how many of you are still doing good on the resolution? I remember who you are. <laughs> <laughs> but John gives us at least two, if not more, promises this morning in our reading. The first one is, in the beginning was the Word. The word word, 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 in the Greek, is actually logos. Logos is like intelligence or mind or... But that's not important. It is. The word word, though... Is very important to us because what are words? They're a mode of communication. They allow us to speak.
speak to each other, right? Parents, you remember when you had your children before they could talk? And you wished when they cried that they could tell you what it is that they wanted, right? You're like, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you dirty? Are you, are you, are you hurt somewhere? And you like expect this answer from them, and all they do is, ah! Right? You want them to speak. And now that they can, you want them to... <laughs> not so much. But that communication is important because we want them to be able to tell us what's wrong so that we can take care of it. And then John this morning, he tells us that Jesus Christ is the Word of God. And He came to earth in flesh to give us a way that we can communicate with God. It's not only us talking to God, but it's God here in the flesh talking to us and telling us what it is that we need to know. It's communication. It's a pathway that allows us to get from God what God wants us to know and for us to understand from God what He's trying to tell us. And the second promise this morning, which is one, the, one of the most important ones, is that Jesus came and He tented with us. Skeno. Skeno is the word. So I might be pronouncing that wrong. The Greek word that is to dwell. And the actual word to dwell in the Greek means to tent or encamp. Jesus came, the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. The Word became flesh, Jesus Christ came down from heaven to become one of us, and He tented with us. It doesn't mean He just came for a visit. He put up His pop-up, and He stayed with us for a while. And not just for a while. He stayed with us forever. Right? Right? We believe that He's come. He came down from heaven, was born of a woman, laid in a major stall, lived His life and showed us how God wanted us to live, went to the cross and died for each and every one of us, and rose again, and stayed with us again. And when He went to heaven, He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us Himself as a different person. God stayed with us. He didn't leave us. He came, he pitched his tent, and he remains with us. Jesus Christ is still with us today. Everywhere we go, everything we do, he's walking with us and talking to us and helping us on our way to know what it is that God wants us to do. He is our mode of communication to God. In God's mode of communication to us. And he came not to leave us alone. But to stay with us forever. And in doing that, he gave us grace. Grace upon grace. I always wondered about that phrase. What that means. How can you get grace upon grace? But Jesus Christ came to give us a gift, a gift of life, and continues in our lives, even when we're not walking with Him, He's still walking with us. Even when we've turned our back, He's still following behind us. That is grace upon grace. And the interesting thing about grace in the, in the Gospel of John, the word grace appears only three times in the Gospel of John. And if you read our lesson from this morning, it's and that's Jesus Christ giving us grace and truth coming and tenting with us dwelling with us forever so when your resolutions fall to the side and you feel like you want to give up don't because you're perfect the way God made you and if God needs you to change he will do it for you if you can continually live with and walk with Jesus Christ who came and pitched his tent to stay with you forever. So follow Jesus, knowing that he's going to lead you down the path that God has prepared for you. And if changes to come, it'll come on that path. 
Not because you wanted it to happen, but because God needed it to happen, and God made it happen. So live your life following after Jesus, knowing that he came to dwell with each and every one of us as that baby in the manger. And the wise men came to see him to give that message to all of you. So live in that light. And know that no matter how bad your life can get, that Jesus is always there with you. And will always walk alongside you. So go into the world and spread that light and that love to everyone.